Proverbs says, My son, reverently fear the Lord and the King, and do not associate with those who are given to change of allegiance and are revolutionary. For the calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the punishment and ruin which both the Lord and the King will bring upon the rebellious. I'm going to tell you why I'm sharing so strongly about this, because our situation isn't new. Christ found himself in exactly the same situation, and that's why we need to reference the commander of our army tonight. What did he do? His situation wasn't very much different. He was born into a nation that was being subjugated and oppressed in ways that we have not had experience of in South Africa. The Romans were not Democrats. The Romans were arrogant so-and-sos. The Jews were just vassals. Christ said, if somebody asks you to carry his load one mile, be a good Christian, carry it two miles. In other words, allow yourself to get abused twice. Because Romans had a legal right to impose whatever burden they wanted to on any Jew close to them. And if the Jew refused, he would get punished most severely. That was, that was just a small example of the kind of tyranny they were subject to. It wasn't an easy place. So Christ had to manage a group of people. They were associated, they were called zealots. They were associated with the Pharisees. And in the same way that the Roman Catholic Church has the Jesuits and the Americans have the CIA, they've got their agents, provocateur, people go around and, and do some scary stuff, provoking wars and assassinating people. And that. Th this was a band of assassins, and they worked for the Pharisees. And I've got a definition of, of them for you. A zealot is a person who is fanatical and uncompromising in pursuit of their religious, political, or other ideals. In Christ's times, there were militant Jewish patriots from the first century that held that violence was justifiable if it would free the nation from their foreign oppressors. And one of Christ's disciples was a former member. There were two Simons among Christ's disciples. One was Simon Peter, and the other one, a quiet guy, was Simon the Zealot. And then there was Judas Iscariot, according to Matthew 10, verse 4, also betrayed him. And I want to make this a following point tonight. Any revolutionary ideology is at war with the Lordship of Jesus Christ or with the Fatherhood of God and therefore at odds with the commitment and loyalty of Christ's disciple. We've, and, and there are lots of isms. And the one thing that they all have in common is they have a problem with you as a Christian because they have, of their allegiance to Christ. And I'm talking about experience. I've been through this. You run with the foxes. And the next thing, the foxes turn around and they turn on you. Believers, I want to appeal to you tonight that when, when we feel the need for change, that is fine. But I tell you what, God will not let you get away with and me get away, and we, we're welcome to do that. But I want to tell you one thing. If we continue to do what we think necessary in the way dictated to by other people and not by Scripture, we're walking away from Christ. We're not seeking the kingdom and His righteousness. Christ is not a revolutionary, and the one thing that bugs me about what is happening now, and I can guarantee you this one thing, now that there's zero increase, watch next year. There's a momentum building, and I still want to know who's driving it. There's an attempt to make this country ungovernable, and, and you may feel heroic because you're going to do it, but let me tell you, when you're done, there's nothing, going to be nothing left, because I tell you, and I'm speaking to students tonight, I was a student too. I was very skinny, starved a lot, had no pocket money, had no transport. You have no idea how many miles I had to walk and hitchhike every day just to get to class. It was far. My parents didn't support me, not with one rand. They couldn't. I had to make my own way, two jobs after university. But you know, it never entered our minds in those days to complain about it or to think ourselves deprived. So I want you to respect where I'm coming from. Activism is biblical. 
because one of the three legs, tenets of the gospel, the gospel encompasses evangelism, altruism, that is helping the defenseless, and activism, standing up and speaking for the defenseless. But God will not let you and I get away with doing it by means that aren't His. And I want to tell you that Scripture is very clear that if you align yourself with a revolutionary agenda, you've walked away from Christ because there's a spirit at work there, believe me. And I want you to go through the whole of Africa and tell me where that story, that same narrative had an, had an opposite ending. We have a redemptive purpose in this nation. God has moved in that way. But there are two things that really, that really bug me tonight about what's going on. And the biggest thing is the whole issue of the rage. James 1.20 says, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And the thing that bugs me the most is that more than 20 years on into our democracy, we are now more racially divided than ever. And I'm very concerned about the inherent, the inherited racial antipathy and friction that exists in our nation. And there's not much one can do about it in the nation, but I, I want to tell you, you cannot be a part of the church of Jesus Christ and not have a conversation about it. God has assigned us an amazing role in this world as South Africans. He's done the most incredible miracles for us. But if we, I'm talking about all of us in this room, and it's relative, but we are privileged. Me with my no food and my no car and my nothing as a student, I was privileged to have access to education. And I thank God for that. And I thank my folks for allowing me to do that, even though they couldn't make it happen for me. They were happy to release me, and they blessed me, and they supported me as best they could, even though they couldn't do it financially. My dad wasn't very supportive in those years, and my mom had to hold on three jobs just to get us through school. She worked herself to death. Many of us have that same story. But we still comprise the 2% of the people on the planet who have access to tertiary education. Now, that's a massive privilege. It's massive. And when you're in a town like Stelmarsh or Wits UCT, our standards are such that we, the top 2% of that 2%, we are incredibly blessed. I'm very disturbed by the fact that come exam times, we're going to do what we did back in the day when we didn't have control because we didn't decide about when the caspers were going to roll in, when the bullets were going to fly. We didn't have a choice. We, did, we weren't in charge of that agenda. We lost a lot of friends, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of killing. It was real. But believers, young people, as Christians, we are not called to light fires that once it's lit, we have no control of. The problem in South Africa, the biggest problem with the economy being in declension is that the vast majority of people between 16 and 35, it's not like they're unemployed. They are unemployable. We have an educational crisis, but it's not a tertiary level. And I say that with respect. Believers, Christ said, as soldiers, we suffer. And we learn to deal with it. We get tough. But I don't, among Christians, I don't care if you're black or white, don't have a conversation with me about microaggressions. If you've not been to the cross, if you've not seen Christ bleed himself to death, then go there and have a look to who you've come to, to who you worship. We can't go through life as like porcelain dolls being sensitive to everything. And I'm speaking to all of us tonight. We are believers. 
there, there, are, there are some things going down in this country right now that is not of the Lord. I want to tell you that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not of God. If you love this country, you'd better start praying that what is being unleashed gets put right back in its box. If this tinder box that you're playing with matches around, if it jumps into the ranks of the unemployable, once their rage is through, there'll be nothing for any of us left. There'll be no future. Sometimes we forget about how blessed we are, how privileged we are. And obviously we're never going to be as blessed as privileged as some other people around us, but we never give in to envy. I want to say tonight that all of this material envy must stop. There'll always be people richer than yourself and more privileged. But we don't go stressing and fretting about that. I know there are a lot of people that can't say what I'm saying now, but I'm wanting to say it. And I'm wanting us to stop playing God, expecting Germans to keep repenting and Afrikaners to keep repenting and Jewish and British people. Let's stop that already. In the body of Christ, we don't do that. It's really time for us to seek God to find out what his program is. I love what um, John, in John 18, 33, 18, 39 to 40 says. And that came after John chapter 12, Christ came into the city. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. People were very excited. And they wanted to proclaim him king. He came in on donkey and everybody was excited. And then the next chapter is in John 18, when Pilate goes to the Jews and he says, listen, you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover, so do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Christ had zealots in his rank. He had very ideological young men, Simon in particular and Judas. Their whole lives were devoted to getting rid of Roman oppression. And it was legitimate. There was nothing wrong with that agenda, except that it wasn't Christ's agenda. And I know that is very hard to accept. But I tell you, I've been through all the cycles. I've... My first fight at university was with Dr. Alan Busak. He had just come back from Holland and he believed that Christ wanted us to take up machine guns and kill everybody. He came back with a whole new gospel, a revolutionary gospel that went beyond the social gospel of compassion. Now they were preaching that God was endorsing violence. Christ was endorsing violence. It's a travesty of the gospel. Christ never said so, he never did so, and he never will. And I say to you young people that what is happening at at UWC, my alma mater, I was at that university. I read the vice chancellor's SOS the other day. He was fearing for his life, trying to dialogue with students, trying to accommodate them. It's a university that's trying. All he got as a response was violence. You cannot follow Christ and fool yourself into believing that he's condoning solidarity with an agenda like that, with a revolutionary agenda. I'm very nervous about these placards being branded about. And I want to tell you one thing. As a Christian, the means never justify the ends. Never. Christ calls us as believers to be patient. We don't cut corners to get to where we want to in a hurry. You may walk out of here and you can be offended with me. I'm fine. Tell you something. On that day, I won't have your blood in my hands. Christ's agenda requires patience in the most extraordinary way. Because you know something? Christ knew better than the zealots back in his day. He knew that Rome's time had come. He knew that it was just a few decades before Rome, that amazing, that mighty empire, would implode on itself. There was no need to run around assassinating people. 
Christ understood their burden and he had it all worked out. He could see things from the bird's eye view. And I tell you people, I want to encourage you tonight to guard your hearts. Proverbs 24 verse 19. It says, don't get fighting mad at evil people. Don't be envious of the wicked. I want to challenge us tonight as to where this rage comes from. Where does this anger come from? I've been reading a lot of posts and I, I, I read a lot of envy right there. And as believers, we can't. There were a lot of Christians exactly in your position just before the Second World War in Germany. A lot of wicked things were being said about Jews, and it all stemmed from envy. The Jews have too much money. The Jews have too much privilege. The Jews have too much access. The Jews have too much leeway. If we open that Pandora's box, every demon comes flooding in, and then it's all systems go. It's not the way of God. We're going to stand in just a moment, but just let me read these things to you. But I do believe our response should be is to seek spiritual agreement and a spiritual mandate together. I really believe that we must engage, but we engage from a position of strength. As a Christian constituency, I was just watching the kids tonight walking down to every nation and to CRC, the most gorgeous kids. Pray for them every time I pass, right? I want to encourage you, and I know we have many leaders here, I know you mean well, that it's time for the body of Jesus Christ to start talking to each other. And if you do stuff, please don't do stuff without at least talking to us as well. What do you think we're here for? Do we sit around wasting our time? Do we preach sermons and go home? We can't tell you what to do, but at least you can tap into our experience. I always said to God, God, whenever the next wave, whenever the next revival comes, I've been praying this since I was 16, let me in a, be in a position where we can engage, where we can talk, where we can keep the devil out, and where we can begin to march like an army. You may not know this tonight, but when you're a disciple, you've enlisted for Christ's army. We only engage social challenges from a place of spiritual strength. And you know spiritual strength? God doesn't need... Millions of people mobilized. He just needs any group, any size that are in spiritual agreement about God's agenda, about what he wants and how he wants it done. That is a battle worth fighting for. But this nonsense about we've got a black grievance and the whites don't understand, please get over that. I want to say it straight up. I, want to, I came to this town... All I got was grief and discrimination, and it still goes on. And you know what? That's none of my business. That's God's business. People ask me, how would you, how'd you do this? I say, well, <clears throat> I had to move a lot of mountains. And they ask me, what mountain? I say, well, they were all in my head. Great is he that is in you and he that is in the world. It's, it's amazing. As soon as we... We deal with social and political issues. We want to shut Christ in his case. We're we like, we like puppeteers. We shut the puppet up, close the case, and he's not allowed to say anything while we're doing the real business, doing real life. You can go on doing that, but don't mess around with God. You can't run and scream violence and, and rage and anger and, and, and abuse today, and tomorrow raise your hand and worship God when the whole body of Christ has been torn apart because we're sitting there judging each other for whatever reason, that has to stop. And I'm talking to white and black today because there isn't a divide in God's book. But I want to tell you people, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, do not get entangled with battles that aren't ours. At all times, first discern which kingdom will benefit most in the aftermath? And you cannot do that on your own. We're going to have to talk to each other. We're going to have to decide together. 
I must say I'm very disappointed with how flagrantly we disrespect the goodness of God. We're on a campus where there are Christians that are committed, they're involved in the SRC, and whenever the first little hiccup comes, guess what? Everybody turns against the Akolile, known as Diamond. I don't want to see that happen again. I don't want to see in our ranks that God would raise up a man like Maimani to lead a party and then everybody turns around and says he's a coconut or whatever. He's being used. I've had that leveled against me all my life. I'm the only one on the whole continent of Africa that has got a cross-cultural ministry. I'm the only one because the rest are all there judging me because I'm not black enough. Black people, I want to speak to you tonight. It's time for us to cast off our shame and at least to believe in each other. I can't, can't understand this nonsense. Every time somebody gets up like a crab out of the pot to move to the sea where we belong, we get ridiculed and disrespected. All we get is disloyalty. I don't want to see that happen among believers ever again. The only reason why, why Diamond is over there is, is because he's being used by the white SRC, he's being used by the establishment. My goodness, have some respect for what God is doing. He's opening double doors, he's raising people up. As believers, we stand together. That's our first priority. And whether it's black or white, it doesn't matter. Just as long as somebody stands for Christ, we pray for him, we support him. If we must make choices that we're not comfortable with, we make a choice for Christ and the people of Christ. Otherwise, you must find yourself another army. The days that we're going to, we cannot go on being fractured the way we are. Satan is fracturing us. Can we stand tonight? It's time to engage in a war for souls. And you've got to ask yourself, is, is what we're busy with, is what we're so passionate about, is it going to draw people closer to Christ? Or are we going to have no fees and have a whole bunch of people go to a Christless eternity and be all happy? Because we've made a choice for this life, for, for the shortcuts and for the temporal things. Christianity is not a popularity contest. I'm not trying to win votes here tonight. I'm trying to get souls to the cross, to Christ. And I want to challenge you with just one thing tonight. You must decide whether you're a disciple or a consumer. Consumers get offended because they've got expectations. Those expectations are called entitlements. But if you're a disciple, you understand that you've been called to relinquish your rights. Whether you're white or black or yellow, it doesn't matter. Jesus said, if you would come after me, take up your cross, throw away your rights, deny yourself, and follow me. And God sets us up politically so that we can make that choice. It's a tough choice. It's a hard choice. And it's so easy to run with the victims and with victimhood and with the aggrieved. And we've got compassion for them. We minister to them. But we minister Christ to them in love. But we don't rage with them. We don't destroy. I want to speak to Christians who are disrespectful of institutional life. The institution of Stellenbosch University. It's a great university. It's not perfect, but it's great. And if you can't say that to yourself, then get honest. I'm speaking as one that gets a lot of grief. As a church, we get a lot of grief. We're not welcome. That's why we're not sitting on campus. We're sitting here. But you know what? I'm not going to get disrespectful of people that work hard and accomplish and provide some of the best people professionally on the globe today. And when you come from the outside, whether it's here or in Japan, you've got to fight your way in when it's a different place. But we don't walk in there like kings and lords wanting to take it over, wanting to trash everything. We're not, we're not Islamist extremists. We're Christians. 